I want to welcome all of our uh, online viewers whenever you're watching this. Glad you are watching and uh, participating with us at Community. Um, you know, we have 4th of July is just around the corner, right? Just a few days away. Uh, some of you are entering into a very long holiday weekend because you have extra days off work, so good for you. Uh, enjoy that. But I hope that uh, as we think about, you know, like our independence and our nation and all those kind of things, that it always drives us to pray. You know, we've been praying all month for our valley, and we want to just keep praying for our valley, but we want to be praying for our nation. There's, there's a bunch going on. And, uh, you know, instead of grabbing a megaphone on Facebook and yelling at other people who disagree with you, we should be, we should be prayer warriors, praying for our, our valley, praying for our country, praying for all the things that are happening that uh, God then can use us, even in, in one-on-one moments, you know, to show his love and his grace and his light to somebody else. So all that's going on. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, this is kind of the end of our fiscal year. And um, one of the things I wanted to share with you guys is some really cool news, too. Uh, one of the missions that we support is in Cambodia, and what we do there is we train pastors and we plant churches. And because of that ministry, over the last 30 years, like there are thousands and thousands of people in Cambodia and now in Thailand and in Laos, um, you know, it's just continuing to spread because of what's been going on there. And uh, the main uh, church complex uh, in Battambang, which is the second largest city in Cambodia, they needed uh, to just tear down the old bathrooms and build some new ones. And so what we uh, decided to do was help them with this. So we just sent them $20,000 so they could do this. And that's because of you, because of your generosity. So this, this is not just any bathroom. I mean, this is a huge bathroom because when we have people on campus for those training events, there are sometimes more than 200 people, men and women who come for those. They're fed three times a day, and they, they actually sleep in these uh, dorms, and then they have this, big, this uh, big bathroom they're building on here, as well as it also has a, um, a little, uh, little apartment on the back of it for the security guard. So he has a place to stay at night. And uh, anyway, so this is all going on, and it's because of your, your um, generosity. So I want to let you know this is another cool thing that uh, community has been able to do. Uh, this this last year, and it's been a very, very, very good thing. Um, we are in a series called uh, Final Instructions, and we're going to be this week in John chapter 17, if you want to find that. Uh, I did find, speaking of findings, I found something out that I had never noticed before. Never. So as you know, the last few weeks, we've been in the same section, like from John 13 through John you know, 18 next week. Um, this is like the, the, the Lord's Supper, the, they're having the Passover, they're in the upper room, and all this leads up to next week when Jesus is arrested. I mean, it happened the same night, but next week we'll be talking about that. And so all this is happening, but I never noticed this until this time. At the end of John 14, okay, so in John 13, Jesus washes their feet. We know that they had the Lord's Supper. John 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, I'm going to prepare a place for you. At the end of John 14, he says... Let's get out of here. Actually, he says, like, let's, let's get up and let's go, all right? So um, it, it feels kind of like then chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 70, where are they, like, standing in the doorway? Like, they didn't get out? It's like, you're like, well, you don't know my spouse. That, that could happen. You could be there for hours right there, you know? Um, but it just seems like I've never noticed that before. Like, he said at the end of chapter 14, okay, let's go. Now, in, in chapter 18, we know that he finally crosses the Kidron Valley. He winds up in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's when he prays, not my will, but yours be, your be, yours be done. And then he's arrested. But there's, there's a prayer we're looking at this week. But, but know this, chapter 15, 16, and 17, apparently, they're, they're walking. And I never caught that before. So you go look up at the end of John 14, and he says, hey, let's get out of here, or whatever he says. And so apparently, they're walking. So then I, I'm thinking, okay, wait a minute. So when he says... I am the good vine. Maybe they're walking past the vineyard. And he's just like, hey, this, this reminds me of something else I want you to understand. And then they're walking along, and he's, he's just talking about the, the, this is great helper, the Holy Spirit. We talked more about him last week. He just, they're walking along, and all the while, he knows where he's walking. He's walking into a crucifixion. But he's still teaching. And he's walking with his disciples, just preparing them and letting them soak in some stuff. So now we know later he's going to pray, not my will, but yours be done. This is recorded in the other gospels for us, but there's a, there's a different prayer recorded in John and it's a longer one. And he covers a lot of stuff here. And so we're going to look at some things I want us to see. I, I, what I want you to know going in, what he never prays for. 
Jesus never prays, God, please let them just follow their heart. He never says that. He never says, oh, Father, please help them find themselves. Please help them believe in themselves. Help them find their own truth. He never says, God, Father, whatever it takes, make them happy. He's never prayed those things. But he prays some like earth shaking, powerfully profound things in John 17. And we're going to look at a handful of them. I have one I really wanted to focus on, but I couldn't give you that without giving you the whole picture. So we're going to be in John 17, kind of working our way through this. So he says this early on in the prayer. He says, now I'm departing from the world. They are staying in this world. And some of us are like, oh, please <laughs> just blow that trumpet. Let's get out of here. Let's go, right? He goes, but they're going to be staying here. But I am coming to you, Holy Father. You have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. This is ultimately the prayer I want to get to. He's going to pray again about our being united, our unity, our being one. He, that's a big part of this prayer, and this is how he starts. But I want you to see some other things that are pretty powerful and, and pretty important. He, he also prays for joy in the midst of our pain. A really good friend of mine, his name is Tim Liston. He's a pastor of a church south of uh, Houston area, great church. He, he made an observation that I think is pretty, pretty special. He said, when parents go to pick up their kids from kids' church, they always ask two questions, and they always ask them in the same order. Question number one, did you have fun? Question number two, did you learn anything? And then he says, are we that shallow? No. We just know if there's no joy in it, they're not going to want to stay in it, right? So we ask, did you have fun? So our joke at Community is we're the church that makes kids cry. And, and it's, it, you got to know the context so that you get it, right? But our kids have so much fun. There's a lot of times when I'm kind of outside watching and kids are going to be dragged to a car crying. They don't want to leave. They're having fun and they're learning. But, but there's got to be joy in it in order for them to, to stay with it, right? So this is Jesus' prayer. Now I'm coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with my joy. I love that phrase, but there's another translation that says it this way, that they would have the full measure of my joy. Same verse, just a different way to say that. But that's part of his prayer for us, that we would have joy, like real joy. I know that there are people in our church, and I'm just going to tell you, I'm amazed by some of you. Because you've been through the storm. You've been through the pain. You've been through the hurt and the discouragement of so many different things. You still have joy. And you still show up here. And you still serve. And you still serve with a smile. It's like, Wow. Like, thank you for allowing the joy, the fullness of God's joy, Christ's joy, like show up in your life, even in, in your own pain sometimes. Like you've been able to connect with that. You know what that means. And I appreciate that. But then he gives us this example. So I'm going to fly back to John 16. He said this, but we didn't cover this last week, but he's talking about the same thing. He says, to tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn over what is going to happen to me, but the world will, will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. Okay, so this is, he's, he's still talking about what's about to happen to him, but he says, even in our pain, we can have joy. It will be like a woman suffering the pains of labor. When her child is born, her anguish gives way to joy because she has brought a new baby into the world. Now, I have never given birth to a child. But I understand it's quite painful. That's what my wife told me. And I still have marks on my arm from 30 years ago uh, where she was insisting that I understand how painful it was, right? Now, in all fairness, I do know something about pain. I've had a kidney stone. 
I would appreciate a little sympathy. <laughs> I've talked to women, and I'm not joking. My wife doesn't like me telling this, but it's true. I've talked to women who said they've given birth to a child, and they've had a kidney stone, and a kidney stone was more painful. So a little more sympathy, please, right? When I found out what possibly caused it, because the doctor says, I don't know for sure, he says, do you drink much soda? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, that may have caused it. And I'm like, I just quit. I was like 38, 39 years old. I quit drinking soda. Every now and then I'll, have, I'll steal a little sip out of Michelle's Dr. Pepper, but I just don't drink. So it's like, I never want to go through that pain again, like knock me to the floor kind of pain. But here's the big difference. Kidney stone, pain, not even a cool story to tell. Having a baby, pain, but within seconds, within seconds of the anguish and the pain, that mother is just wrapped in joy holding that baby for the first time. And maybe not right away, but then they say, let's do this again, right? And maybe not the same day. They're not going to bring it up right then, but it's like, it's not that long. And they're like, you know what? The pain was worth it. It was worth it. And Jesus is just making this point. So like it's, you're going to be in pain, but man, there is joy that's coming. Because he was referring to him walking out of the grave. Like everything changes with that kind of news, right? And so like, I, I still remember Michelle when, when we had our first child. Her name is Samantha. We thought, we didn't, we didn't want to know, but we thought she was a boy the whole time. One of the reasons was, every time we went to the doctor's office, her heart rate was 120, which is kind of like a boy's heart rate. Girls are usually 140 to 160. If you didn't know that, you're welcome. Anyway, um, little babies in the womb, like little girls, usually a faster heart rate. Boys were right around 120. She was 120 every time, like on the money. So we're like, it's a boy. We didn't have a girl's name picked out. Right? And so this little bundle of joys enters, and, and the doctor says, it's a girl. And Michelle just goes, praise God, it's a girl. She really wanted a girl so bad. And she's holding that little baby. I mean, like, I don't need to give you all the details, but she really wanted an epidural, and they never gave her one. They said it was too early, then it was too late. She still to this day blames me, thinks I had something to do with that. Like, I did not. Like, I'm not Mr. Epidural Man. But I know this, as bad as the pain was, it was all of a sudden, praise God, she's a girl, right? Second child we have, similar kind of thing. She goes through the whole process, and then it's like, praise God, it's over. So I knew we were only having two, but, but, there was joy, like immediately in that moment, there's joy. John, then he says this in, in John 16, just Jesus talking. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Then you will rejoice and no one can rob you of that joy. No one, no circumstance, no situation, nothing can rob you of the joy because the joy is found in Jesus and he's the same yesterday and today and forever. Like our circumstances change all the time. There's things that can suck the happiness out of us, but nobody can rob us of the joy that we have. And so he prays for us that we would have this joy, the full measure of his joy. And then he prays this, that we would have protection from the evil one. Now, this is important. Paul tells young Pastor Timothy, you don't have a spirit of timidity, you have a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. And the reason that's important is because we're in a battle, right? So if you read Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about the full armor of God. By the way, all the armor's on the front. I love that. Like, we're supposed to be advancing the word of God, advancing the gospel, advancing the mission. There's nothing to protect our back because we're, we're going to be going forward. The gates of hell cannot prevail against us. Like, we're on the move. All the armor's in the front, but we need that protection because of the evil one. He is there, right? Listen to this. He says, I'm not asking... You take them out of the world. Again, we're like, no, please, go ahead and take us, right? But to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Keep them safe from the evil one. There's something about the way that, that Jesus like, shares with his guys that like, 
walking along, talking with them, preparing them. And now he's literally just praying. I don't know if he's walking and praying out loud. I don't know if they've stopped somewhere and sat. Maybe he's, he's sitting on this side of the Kidron Valley looking over at the, the, the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing he's going to be over there, knowing he's going to be arrested. And he just kind of takes a moment and he prays with his guys around him. Part of his prayer that, that we'd be protected because we're in a battle because there's so much, so much at stake. This is such good news though. First John 4, 4 says this, the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Now, the reason I wanted to pop this verse in here is because I think when it comes to our enemy, we, we do one of two things. Either we grossly underestimate him or we grossly overestimate him. We typically fall on one side or the other. So the people who would underestimate the devil have no idea how truly cunning and deceptive he is. They have no idea how much he relishes the idea of you completely failing. He would love to see your family just broken apart. Like, that's what he wants. He wants to see you fail more than you realize. So we underestimate how cunning and crafty and how intent he is on making us fail. But we overestimate his power. Did you know that? He is not equal to God. Not at all. The Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit, who lives in you is greater than the Spirit, small s, small little wimpy s, who lives in the world. Like, no, God is greater than the devil. Like, they're not like, they might be on opposite sides, but they are not equal. And so, so don't forget that. And then he prays this. He says, I want them to be sanctified by the truth. Now, in the translation I'm going to read to you, it doesn't use that exact phrase, but that's the phrase that is translated in other translations right here. So here, here's what he's saying. Make them holy by your truth. Okay, make them holy. That's sanctified. And I'm going to kind of explain that. It's kind of pretty churchy kind of sounded word, but it's a great word, so I wanted to use that word. But he says, make them holy by your truth, Teach them your word, which is truth. I'm going to stop right there for a second. Okay, so the word is so important. That's why we say every day with Jesus. Like we need the word of God in us, the word. The world says everything you need is within you. You can shape your own destiny. Sounds really good. But the word says you are in desperate need of God and you can't do it on your own. Like the world says, you're the center of the universe. The world is your oyster. You can even, in the words of the theologian Burger King, have it your way, right? No, the word says, no, it's not all about you. But the one who it is all about cares about you and loves you. And that's a very different thing. So make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy. Again, be sanctified by your truth. So being sanctified, let me just tell you this word. Being sanctified means this. It's a lifelong process of God's spirit Using God's word to make you more like God's son. Okay, did you get that? Sanctification, being sanctified is a lifelong process of the, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, working in you, using the, the, the word of God to help you become like the son of God. Now, I'm gonna give this to you on a chart so this makes sense to you, all right? So saved, so here, here's me way down here. This is my life without Jesus. And there is a moment in my life where I say, you know what? I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I want to give him my life. Maybe we, we're going, we, we get baptized. We, we make it public. We tell the world, I am all in. I want Jesus. And that, that exact moment, boom, I'm saved. I'm saved. But the process of becoming more like Jesus is this lifelong process. This is what it means to be sanctified. So I, I start out, I'm becoming more like, I have some bad days. I have some bad months. Maybe I have a bad year. I'm, I'm working my, I'm, I'm and, and, and this is the cool thing. Any time along here, when I've made the decision, if I were to die, I'm saved. A few more years later, I'm, I'm becoming more like Jesus. If something happened to me, I'm killed in an accident, I'm saved. 
I'm still working to become more like him, but I'm not working to earn my salvation. Jesus did that for me. Does that make sense? So being sanctified is this lifelong process where God's spirit uses God's word to make me more like God's son. Let's say I'm just cooking along, I make it way over here, boom. But when I do go, I get to be with him. I'm saved. But being sanctified is what Jesus is praying for here. Make them holy. Make them like me, like this process that takes time that we, we finally get there. There's a, there's a really cool book I read years ago called The Church of Irresistible Influence by Robert Lewis. He said this, I realized that we didn't need to be slicker or trendier to draw people in our community to Christ, but better and holier. Now, he doesn't mean like holier like the church lady on SNL back in the day. Oh, and that's special, right? No, he means holier, more like people who have been in this process, we're becoming more like Jesus. The, the way we draw people to Jesus is by being more like Jesus. It has nothing to do with being hip. It has to do with being more like Jesus. He says, that's the key. That's what I figured out. But I wanna, I wanna focus in on the prayer, the part of the prayer that to me I think just has this huge impact for all of us. All of, the, all of this does, but this is huge, that we would be one, that we, his followers, would be united, that we would be one. I took this um, picture a couple years back when I was up in uh, San Francisco. Not that picture. There it is, finally. Come on, come on, man. So I took this picture. It's Golden Gate Bridge. And I, re I remember uh, being there. We were, we were there for a couple of days. I took pictures of this bridge at sunrise, at sunset, and at all kinds of times in between. I've got different angles. Like, I just, I wanted to take pictures of the Golden Gate Bridge, Right. So I get there. But now when I'm, I'm looking at some of these pictures, it reminds me of this story I heard. So this guy is, is up on the bridge. And he's about ready to jump. This guy sees him. And he runs up. And he goes, wait, 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 don't do it. The guy goes, why not? He goes, do you believe in God? He goes, yeah. He goes, are you Christian or Jew? He goes, I'm Christian. He goes, me too. He goes, are you, are you Catholic or Protestant? He goes, Protestant. He goes, me too. He goes, what franchise? He says, Baptist, Bap me too. He goes, are you, are you conservative Baptist or liberal Baptist? And he goes, I'm conservative Baptist. He goes, me too. He goes, are you Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He goes, I'm Northern conservative Baptist. He goes, me too. He goes, are you Northern conservative fundamental Baptist or Northern, Northern conservative reform Baptist? He goes, I'm Northern conservative fundamental Baptist. He goes, me too. He goes, well, are you Northern uh, conservative fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes region or Northern conservative Baptist Eastern region? He goes, I'm Northern conservative fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes region. He goes, me too. He says, are you Northern conservative fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes region council of 1897 or are you Northern conservative fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes region of 1912 council, and he goes, I'm, I'm Northern conservative fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes region council of 1912. And the guy goes, you heretic, and pushes him off the bridge. So you didn't see that coming, did you, right? But just, man, that was hard. That was a hard story to tell. Yeah, thank you. It's not as hard as having a kidney stone, but it was hard, right? <laughs> no, it's like, Man, we live in such a world where we find the smallest things to divide over instead of looking to the one that we can unite over. We, we live in a divided culture. I don't know if you've realized this yet, right? And we're not even talking about Christianity now. Just like in American culture, we are split down the middle, it seems like. Everybody has a, a, an opinion, and they're just like polar opposites, and we're getting further and further apart. One of my friends said this back in 2020, and so I revamped it a little bit because 2020 was a presidential election year. This one's not, but it's still the same idea. He said, when, oh, he said, the candidate that wins in November will win because the American people voted for that person, whether it's your candidate or not. He says, your candidate will win or lose based on who America votes for in November. And then he said this, but the church of Jesus will win or lose 
based on how we treat each other every day until then and beyond. Doesn't that make sense? You know, elections come and go, but the way we treat people is really what makes a difference. And Jesus' prayer here is so powerful. I, I want you to catch this because it, it, he unpacks the purpose of the unity prayer. He says, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Who does that include in this room, by the way? Okay, we'll let this one soak in. Jesus is moments away from being arrested and beaten and crucified, and he takes the time to pray for you and pray for me. For all who ever believe in me, through the message, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. He gets to the point of the whole thing that the world would believe, but there's this, there's this passionate prayer that we would be united. You know, I, I believe that God knows and knew even at the moment, just some 40 days or so from here, the day of Pentecost happens, the church is launched. It's, it's launched by a bunch of Jewish people in Jerusalem who believe Jesus is the Messiah. But Jesus knew that the church would be so much more diverse than just a bunch of Jewish guys in Jerusalem. You fast forward to the book of Revelation that says every nation and every tongue and every language is around the throne. Like he knew that we would be a diverse people and he's just saying, but whatever our differences, we've got to be united. We've got to be together in this. He says, I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. He wants, he wants the world to know. And unity for us, unity for us is like credibility. You know, we've talked before about like our top five, the, the people that we're praying for, the people we're, we were wanting to invite. We said, uh, just a few weeks ago, we gave everybody a towel. We talked about being servants. And we said, you know, think of your top five. Think, think of the people who are your neighbors, your friends, your family members, coworkers who may not know Jesus or may not have a relationship with him. Like, and start praying for, for ways to be able to serve them. Serving gives credibility to your invitation. I'm gonna tell you, for a watching world, the unity of the church makes a huge difference. It, it becomes the credibility our message. One of the things we did last Sunday night is we met Christians from around our valley, from churches around our valley, met at Hope in the Valley Baptist Church, and we worshiped and we prayed for two hours. We just like, we worship and prayed, worship and prayed, worship and prayed. And uh, I love the fact that we had so many different churches represented there because one of the things I appreciate about the pastors in this valley is that we've decided that while we have different methods, we have different preferences, we might even see certain things in the Bible in different ways. We all see together, we see who Jesus really is. He's Lord, and he's king, and he's boss, and we're not gonna just focus on the things that make our churches different. We're gonna focus on the things that make our churches united. So we've decided we're gonna get together and worship Jesus together. And yeah, and it looks different. And one of the things that's been kind of fun about it, even the one we did here uh, a month before that, is we have different bands from different churches. You know, in some churches, uh, they're gonna sing songs um, very similar to us. Some of them are gonna sing songs from like 30 years ago. We, we had one of the bands that was at the church Sunday night. They did songs that we did 20 years ago. Like, I hadn't heard them since. I go, those are great songs. I forgot about those songs. But we, we do things differently. And it's not just about worship. There's a lot of things we do differently but we all have this in common. Jesus is Lord. And so what I wanna do, I'm just gonna give you a few things to wrap this up. Things, and when I say wrap this up, some of you get so excited. Um, I'm, not, I'm not close yet, so hang in there. But I wanna give you some things I've learned about unity over the long haul, right? Here's some things I've here. Unity is a choice. It's a very like intentional choice that we make. 
to set aside differences, because it's way easier to focus on the differences. So it's a choice that we make, a choice. Um, I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm going to tell you a story that I heard. And, and you know how when, uh, when you hear something and it just sticks with you? Like I heard this almost 30 years ago, and it has forever stuck with me. So let me give you the backstory. There, in, in a wedding ceremony, there is, a, there is a poem that I sometimes use. It's not a poem so much. It's just something that was written. It's called The Art of Marriage. And the art of marriage, the little things are the big things. And the art of marriage, it's being able to hold hands. It's, it's being able to say you love each other every day. And the art of marriage, it's like, it's this beautiful kind of picture. Of, it's, a, it's a cool thing to share at a wedding. But what I've never shared before is the fart of marriage. And some of you are like, where, how did we get there? So here's the quote. Here's the story I heard. I was at a conference for youth pastors, and I heard this story. And the guy was talking about marriage, and he said one of his friends on his wedding night, after the wedding, after the reception, they go to the hotel room. He says she goes into the bathroom to get ready, and he heard noises. And he was wondering if he found the right person, right? And the guy says, and this is the quote that stuck with me forever, marriage is bad sounds and bad smells, end of quote. <laughs> I'm just like, I forever have loved that. It's like, that's just kind of, it's like, if we're really going to be real about life, sometimes it's messy, sometimes it stinks, sometimes there are sounds, like that, that's just real, right? So what it is, is it's a choice to say, you know what, I know your faults, and I know your quirkiness. In fact, there's one thing that when somebody stands in front of God and their family and their friends and they get married, I really, really enjoy being a part of a renewal of vow service. Maybe it's 10 years in, maybe it's 30 years in, maybe it's 50 years in, but this is what they're saying now. I had no idea what I was getting into when we got married, but I know everything about you now. I know your faults. I know your weaknesses. I know your bad smells. But I'm signing up again. How cool is that, right? It's a choice to say there's things about each other that probably even irritate each other. But we're not going to focus on those things. We're going to focus on the love that, that holds us together. It's like it's a very clear choice that we make that we're going to do this. Another thing, unity requires sacrifice. Sacrifice is fun to talk about until it actually costs you something. I'm a sports fan. So one of the things I notice uh, in the last few years in particular in the NBA, uh, I would say uh, when they stopped um, keeping the players in the same teams for a long, long time, and now as soon as they can, then they get a bigger contract somewhere than they go. And so now players are just jumping around. Different. It's like, who's on what team? I don't even know, right? What happened? But what their goal always is, they want to get two or three like hyper superstars on one. If they can get three superstars on a team, because there's typically five on the floor at a time, they feel like they can make a, a, a move for the championship. So like two or three superstars minimum, and then they can make a move. But what makes a great team are not those superstars. What makes a great team are the players, as well as those superstars who are willing to do whatever it takes for the best of the team. It's not the guys at the end of the game who, no matter what the score was, run over to look at their stat line. It's the guys who just look at the score and say, yeah, we lost. I don't care how I played. We lost. We need to do better. Sacrifice is going to require some things of us. And sacrifice has to happen in order for us to be the best team that we can be in the family of God. And then there's one more, and that's unity draws people to Jesus. Like I said, like unity is like credibility for us. When people see us working together, when people look and see that there's different churches who actually get together, like every now and then I'll, I'll you know, be with uh, another pastor from town and we'll be sitting in a restaurant and, and laughing and enjoying each other's company. People are like, what's going on? Those, those guys are from different churches. They think that we're from competing churches. We're not competing. We're on the same team. You know, and so we're encouraging each other, helping each other. That kind of stuff then draws people to Jesus. One of my friends, Trevor DeVage, I just was listening to a podcast this week, and he was being interviewed, and he had a line that I absolutely loved. He said this, we got to earn the right to invite. 
We just had our, our next step dessert last night. And we talk about this idea of well, be a friend and bring a friend. Invest in the friendship and invite the person, right? And I love the way he said this because this is the same idea. Earn the right to invite. How do we do that? Well, it's in the way we treat people, the way we serve, it's the way we love, it's the way we listen, all those things. But we earn the right to invite when, when people see us getting along. I mean, how many times has a church split or a church problem or some church failure then done damage for months or even years to the reputation of that church than to be able to reach anybody? But when we get along, we earn the right to invite. There's something healthy about that kind of thing. In fact, he says this in Ephesians 4.3, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. I read a story about a guy named Dave. Dave was in Vietnam. He was in an accidental napalm explosion. He was severely burned over 90% of his body. A couple of guys were. He was transported to a burn unit. His wife was notified. And he laid in bed knowing that he was completely disfigured, wondering what his wife would say. He hears the footsteps coming down the hospital tile floor. And the lady that appears is not his wife, it's his roommate's wife. And he hears her gasp in horror. And she walks over and he watches the whole thing. She takes off her ring, lays it on his chest and says, I can't be with a freak. And walks out. Two weeks later, that guy was dead. So Dave braced himself for the inevitable response of his wife. He heard the footsteps. This time it is his wife. And she walks in and slows her pace and looks him over from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. Came over beside him, leaned over and kissed him where his lips used to be. And she backed up and she said, Dave, I think in some ways it's an improvement. <laughs> and he laughed and she laughed. And then she said this, I love you. I will always love you. Now let's work on getting you out of here. In two weeks, his roommate had died. In two weeks, he was already out on day trips. And before long, he was discharged, still horribly disfigured. But Dave and his wife would then set out to travel and talk about the power of agape love. Here's why I tell you the story. This is what unites us, the power of his love. You're not part of a church where some people pretty much got it together. And there's, there's a few, they don't even need a lot of help from God. They're doing pretty good. And then there's some other ones, maybe like us, like you know, we're pretty messed up, but we need a lot of God, you know. No, what unifies us is we're all a mess. And we all need this kiss from God. We all need this reminder. He still loves us. That's what unites us. We're, we're not looking at each other and saying, my sin is, is better than your sin or my sin is worse than yours. It's like, no, we're all desperately in need of Jesus. And so our focus is on him. And that's what unites us. And whether you're from northern, conservative, fundamental, you know, whatever church you're from, you still need Jesus. Whether you grew up in church or just found him recently, you still need Jesus. Whether you've tackled some sins with God's help and gotten on top of some of those things, or you're right now in the middle of an addiction, you still need Jesus. I don't need Jesus less today than I did 50 years ago when I said yes to him and I was baptized as a kid. I don't, I don't need less of him now. I need more of him now than ever. And, and we all do. And so we unite, not in our differences, but on the one who loves us and kisses us even though we're a mess. What does the Bible say? Even while we were still sinners, God showed his love to us and gave his son to die for us. And so we unite around the cross.
We unite around an empty tomb. We, we unite around the one who makes all the difference for us. You know, if you're watching online and you just have questions, you can always email us at office at community.cc or use the app. Let us know how we can help you, encourage you. I want us just to take a minute to pray together. And maybe if we could make it personal, let me just walk through those last few things we said. Unity is a choice. So I want you to think of somebody who maybe even in the body of Christ, you're at odds with. Maybe they're the one that's supposed to say sorry first and it seems like you always say sorry first, but I don't care. It's like, what's the next step for you to make things right with somebody? It's a choice. So I want, to make, I want you to make the choice to take that step sort of towards somebody. I was in a singing group when I was in high school. We would meet at a college campus. We would practice for about a week and then we'd go on a 10-day tour. And we traveled on a bus and we had, I don't know, it was like 30 of us, whatever it was. And we did some drama stuff and we sang and it, and it was so much fun. I did it for like three summers in a row. It, it was a great time. One of, one of the years, it's the night before we leave and uh, our director has this brilliant idea. He says, this is what we're gonna do tonight. Before we do any, we would like have a time of worship and prayer before we would set off. He says, before we start worship, I just wanna just give you guys a minute and if you have trouble with anybody, if you're at odds with anybody on our team right here, just the 30 of us, you, you have a problem with anybody, you need to go make it right now. And he just walked away. Like, I guess we're supposed to make it right now, right? I, I wasn't at odds with anybody, man. I get along with everybody. And then this guy came up to me. What's up? I was like, I got a problem with you. What are you talking about? We like the same girl. It was just as small and petty as that. But he took the effort, and he stepped toward me, and we sat there and we prayed together. I still got the girl. No, I, don't, I really don't even remember. I just, I don't remember. I don't even remember who the girl was. I just know that's what the case was. I just know this. He took the step. And I want you to take that step. That maybe they're here tonight, standing outside with ice cream, make it right. Maybe it's a phone call you need to make. Maybe it's somebody you need to see in person. But I want you to choose unity because it's, it's so valuable that the world watching would see us working through even the tough stuff because we're focused on the one who loves us no matter what. Okay, let's pray. God, thank you for your grace, your forgiveness, your patience with us. God, thank you for coming to our rescue when we, we're a total mess. You didn't wait for us to clean up. You didn't wait for us to, to get pretty first like you came to us disfigured and messed up by sin. And you loved us anyway. Thank you. God, help us take that same heart, that same grace, that same acceptance to the people you've placed in our life, maybe within this church, maybe at another church, maybe it's just somebody, man, we just, we're just still at odds with them. God, help us do whatever we can to make things right. And I know we're not always gonna solve it because maybe the other person doesn't want to, but help us take the steps we need to because you're worth that kind of an effort. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone said, amen. Love you guys. We'll see you next week. If you want to pray with somebody, you need some prayer, just make your way up here. All right, thanks.